Hi, everybody. I'm Sander, and I'm really excited to explore together with you the world beyond cinema with AI. If we go back in time into the 40s and 50s, uh, when the film cameras were started to be used to make movies, the first thing that we did and knew how to do was point them at theater stages, and those became the first movies. We could not have imagined where the storytelling would take us, that we would go on roller coaster rides with the Dark Knight to the Batman, or we would have stories uh, using VFX such as The Lord of the Rings. Those industries just did not exist. They were unimaginable at the time. And that happened again when we moved to television. What we were doing was pointing cameras at radio shows, and those became the first television shows. Similarly, our imagination was so focused on taking the existing paradigm and applying it to the new medium. We, at the time, couldn't imagine the world where we would have TV series, binge watching, or some of our favorite shows out there today. Again, opening up industries, requiring new skill sets that we couldn't imagine in the beginning. The same thing happened with the internet, where we had newspapers. We were literally just replicating them almost one-on-one -on -one to the web pages, without, again, realizing the full potential that we can move from the web one world, where it's just one way we are dis distributing content, to the world where we can interact with content. We can have a two-way conversation. We can like, share, we can create. And we couldn't imagine that opens up the world of creator economy today on YouTube or some of the other social platforms where we spend time mostly on the web today. Again, that was unimaginable at the time when it started. And the same thing is happening now with AI. Like we're on the web, we're doing 2.4 million Google searches every minute. What is the thing that we're doing with AI? Most of 70% of the people are using it to get answers to their questions or generating images because we're, that's the, what we do online already. We're sharing photos on social media. So that's the paradigm that we're following even now as AI is starting. We're just mimicking the same behavior on the new medium and focusing on just doing the existing stuff with AI so they can be better, faster, cheaper. But where we want to move with this session is look at the second phase, the things that are uniquely enabled by AI, the new mediums, the new formats, the new platforms that might emerge as the evolution uh, that will come by by embracing those technologies. So it's going to change how we create content, how we distribute content, how we consume content. On distribution side, on creation side, we've already moved from the world where it took hundreds of thousands of dollars to get started in the analog age to the digital world we live in today, where it just takes a couple of thousand dollars to get started to create content, to the world where those tools are almost free and enabled by AI and just natural language, we're able to create absolutely anybody is able to create anything. For example, the Roblox um, uh, team who has built the generative AI chatbot, instead of knowing how to code and design those 3D worlds, you can now just use natural language to describe what you want the experience to be. So everybody who's playing the games or experiencing it can move from becoming a consumer to becoming a creator. Or think about some of the top podcasts in the technology sector. Uh, Wondercraft built the podcast themselves that became one in the top 30 that is fully generated using just natural language saying what the podcast needs to be about, talking about the top, uh, top 10 news every day from Hacker News. It's also going to change distribution. You know, when it was just a couple of thousand film executives deciding in the analog era what's going to be popular to the world that we live in now with creators, where there's millions of YouTubers and influencers are creating content, publishing more than 37 million videos every day. We're moving to a world where everything will be generated um, as, uh, as to the consumers. For example, character AI, who's had more than two and a half million characters built on their platform, where you can use that to build up your study buddy, uh, who you can talk to. It can be your relationship coach. It can be your life coach. Uh, it can be your, uh, your date. Whatever you want the character to be, you have the ability to design and build that and converse with them. Or take even Karen AI, who's a Snapchat uh, creator and influencer with more than 10 million subscribers. She today has a relationship from one to many. She's just publishing out the content. Now she's having those one-on-one -on -one conversations where people pay $1 per minute, and she made 72,000 in the first 24 hours, and they're able to have a conversation with her on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Audio? There is no audio? Then we're just going to move on. On the consumption side, 
we're moving from the analog era where TV channels decided what's going to be on TV at 5 p.m. on a Friday night that everybody is going to see, to the world that we live in today that is powered by social channels uh, that curate their algorithms, curate the feeds to us based on what's published on those platforms. But we're moving to a world where everything is going to be hyper-personalized just to ourselves, so we have a singular experience that is tailored to our experiences. One of the examples here is a company that I work with called Mini Studio. And they're building technology where kids are able to create, using their imaginations, tangibly draw a pa on a paper, a piece of paper, a character. By taking a photo of that character, that character becomes live in a 3D world. And then the kids are able to converse and study with them, the character that they invented, they created just for themselves, so that the world around them will become so much more interactive and immersive. Another example that we're going to uh, quickly talk about is from Venice Pianale, uh, one of the Johnny, personalized VR experiences. Did you know that we don't just exist here in our physical form, but that our energy extends all around us into unseen worlds? The professor told me I was like a portal to help others explore what lay beyond. I will show you. But don't worry, every world is unique and they disappear just as quickly as I conjure them. All I can offer is guidance, showing you the bridge from consciousness to the hidden and concealed worlds beyond. I hope you'll join me. Or Spotify. Now 30% of the listening time on Spotify is driven by Spotify DJ, which creates personalized curated channels for them with a radio host that's just talking to you based on the context of your life events where you were at a certain period of time, playlist that's just relevant to you, and bringing your... Hey, Max, what's going on? I'm X, and from this moment on, I'm going to be your own personal AI DJ on Spotify. Let's go. Up next, I know you've been on a summer song kick lately, so I went back for some of your old summertime favorites. See if it warms you up. The reality is that today, as with any new technology, we're so focused on the negative aspects of it. It's going to kill human creativity. We're all going to lose our jobs. It's going to be the end of originality or human touch. We're going to lose unique voices. Um, and we're going to have lots of bias. And it's so natural for humans to cling on the negative side whenever new technologies emerge and criticize it rather than see the opportunity in it. And that history has been repeating itself multiple times. If you think about the typewriter, the same concerns. 25% of the population was just focused on adding admin work using typewriters before they were yeah, writing up sorry, by their hands before typewriters came around. The same concerns around low quality, lacking personal touch, health concerns were around at the time. But we couldn't imagine today going back to the world where we all had to use handwriting. Or take the printing press in Gutenberg, the religious political control and the bias what's distributed. The loss of art distribution was just duplicating somebody else's work. All of similar concerns are manifesting themselves now as well, because that's automatically where our mind goes to. But with this, now that we're going to go into our panel, we want to look at the future from the opportunistic point of view and inspire all of you to see what kind of areas AI will unlock to creators, how AI can augment human creativity um, and truly help us create new possibilities. So with that, I would like to introduce our panel with Joanna Floor. We can give them a round of applause, who's an executive producer at InWorld AI um, and currently focused on the last missing piece of convergence of immersive media, leveraging AI to grant intelligence and emotion to characters. She's also an experienced award-winning producer from theater to TV and more recently in AR and XR experiences. Elizabeth, come on stage, who's an award-winning creative and XR technologist. So she's building the technology, currently serving as the Global Augmented Reality Director at Accenture Song. She came from seven years at Global Creative Lead at Meta, with a focus on building XR tools and developing XR wearables, glasses, and somatic trackers. And Tino, who you might have seen before, a demo from Move AI, the founder and CEO, who is a leading AI and physical sciences research company dedicated with the aim to democratize 3D animation. Um, Tina also spent nine years at Imperial College here, pursuing masters and a PhD focused on material science and 3D modeling. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Before we get into the topic, um, I would love each one of you to take us back to the moment in time, and I'm sure we've all had, you can also travel back in time yourself, where you were like, wow, 
this experience blew my mind, and I want to be involved in the space, and you decided to go all in. What was that moment in time for you, uh, Joanna? Um, I, to give you that moment, I need to give you a little bit of my background. I sure. try to, to be super brief. So um, as you said at the beginning, I work in theater. I'm a theater kid. And my entire career in technology has been chasing that kind of immersion and convergence of the different media to tell stories. Um, in the last few years, you know, spent working on AR, AI, trying to match, uh, you know, your digital twin to physical spaces, centimeter accurate, these digital layers that would allow us to tell stories and blend all these different worlds. Um, and we got there. And then we had characters. And those characters were dumb. And there's nothing that could go, could go around to make them less dumb. They would understand the space, they would move around, but you couldn't communicate effectively with them. And that was a pet peeve. And then I start, OK, what's out there? And that's how I landed in in-world AI. I think these guys, this is what they're trying to do. Uh, and we're an advanced uh, character engine. So in fact, we're in the business of making brains or giving creators the ability to create brains to populate their characters and their stories. And uh, I got there. I wasn't sure, you know, we're still a very young company, but my big moment was we're doing this study with Neil Stevenson, that the writer of Snow Crash, you know, coined the term of metaverse, incredible writer, and we're doing this study together where he expanded on the existing lore of Snow Crash, crafting a character, feed the knowledge, fill the personality into our system, and then you saw creator and creature talking to one another. Mm. Wow. And because you build that knowledge and that depth, the, the strength of those conversations you know, was mind-blowing. And then I could con converse with that character, and I was like, this is something. If you give this, ta th this tool to creators, and then they can co-create their own creatures, this is the future. And that got me Then you were in. all in. That, that was in. Uh, yeah, Amazing. Exactly. What was it for you, Elizabeth, like that you moment in time? You've set me up so beautifully, by the way, so thank you so much. <laughs> so I want to take you back. Actually, there's a reason why I'm telling you this story. There's a million wow moments in AI, and AI has been the foundation and part of the fabric of our everyday computing, everyday living, everyday communicating for a very long time now, right? So I, I think that folks who are saying there's an AI revolution, they're talking about an AI consumer revolution or a certain kind of AI artistic revolution, which we can talk about more. Back in 2017, when I had just joined ye old Facebook, right? And I was working on the AI team, and there was a team called FAIR. Do you guys remember this? This was one of the great big scare tactic clickbaity moments mm -hmm. where people got terrified of AI. The word on the street was they made two language models that were built to negotiate. You guys remember this stuff? Two language models that were built to negotiate, and we were working on them, and they had a neural network that was designed to do exchanges, right? So in all of the press, the word was that the two robots created their own language and then started communicating and locked everyone out, and it was like this super AI, super, AI, super intelligence scare moment. That's not what happened at all. What happened was the AI did what the AI does best, which is it found the most efficient way to communicate on the paradigm or the terms that they had been negotiated in the beginning. They had been designed to talk in a certain way with certain tools, and they figured out the fastest way to do that between the two of them. Basically, the model was abandoned because it was no longer interesting. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff came out of it that was super interesting, but when the ro robot went off the rails, they were like, okay, got it, you guys are now communicating in machine language, no longer interesting for study. The reason I bring that up is because when we talk about AI, people get nervous because we long to anthropomorphize AI. AI is not human, right? And the singularity and all that stuff is part of our desire to 
cause it to be human, right? We want to understand it, and therefore it has to have feelings or you know, its own consciousness, et cetera. But AI has a reason to exist on its own, and I think that when we start to separate that into sort of its own alien intelligence and appreciate what it can do, and then, importantly, set parameters for what we want to use it for and what we deliberately do not, then we'll be out of sci-fi and into an actual positive future. Awesome. To you. And Tino, what, what was that moment in time for you, briefly, where you were like, wow, this is mind-blowing? Yeah, my, my mind's been blown multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take you back to some of the, the early times that happened. So about five, six years ago, I was doing my PhD at Imperial College here in London, and I was working on material modeling. And I came across computer vision and the ability to essentially you know, use AI to track what's happening in video. And so I'm, t I'm messing around with this. And then in the end, I end up pointing a camera at myself. And it's tracking my motion using pose estimation. And that blew my mind. Immediately, um, or, or quite soon afterwards, I was in a situation where my wife and I, we had our first child. And I didn't have time to work out anymore. So um, yeah, it's pretty crazy when you've got a crying, crying baby in the house. So I cancel my gym subscriptions. I start working out from home. In my living room, using these apps to do press-ups, uh, squats, sit-ups. It was all super boring. And I'm like, hey, let's use uh, this AI, this tech, to track my own workout, to try to create a digital coach at home. I made an app, and I shared it with some other people, and, and people find value from it. And I, and I found that mind-blowing and exciting, that now we've got this technology that you can hyper-personalize these experiences for yourself, and I could put it together relatively easily. And I guess fast forward six years, and now we've got this product that allows people to capture high quality 3D motion using just uh, GoPros, any video, iPhones. And what we're seeing our creators make, like there's somebody in Argentina who loves tango. He's created a scene where he's, this guy's practicing tango on the rooftop wow. in, in, in Argentina. I was like, I can't believe you're that interested in tango. You're going to learn this whole 3D workflow. You're going to use motion capture. You're going to create this experience just for yourself and your friends. And we're going to see some of the examples that you're going to show us a little later as well. Fascinating. So we would never have had Move AI unless Tino wanted to get fit. <laughs> Almost. Um, let's queue up Joanna's video, because you brought something that you wanted to share with all of us that, that you're working on, right? So we yeah. can uh, play, play the video from expanding the world of in-world. <laughs> Jabba smell like? Jabba that has smells like a mixture of spices and sweat. What do you think of humans? Oh, humans? Well, I have mixed feelings about you all. You're much more sophisticated, you're saying, than your predecessor, Natty. Natty is a name I'd rather not hear again. That's all I'll say on this matter. Be careful. There's an abnormally large charger guarding the power core. Watch I out. See, you're also observant. I'm just fighting with it. What side quests were we working on? Ah, oh, yes. We were working on the side quest where we need to bring some outlaws to justice. We're a movement, and we're committed to making sure that robots never threaten our way of life again. So go ahead and pull the trigger if that's what you want. Well, I, I kind of ask for it, I guess. What can you do for me? I can show you all the fun places to visit in Kidstopia. I'm going to take out the enemy's main hive. Here's your gun. Follow me. Fascinating, wow. Thank you. When, um, with technologies like InWorlds um, that give minds to characters in cinema and gaming and make them immersive and interactive, where do you see those existing mediums 
evolving into? I, I, we, we touched base briefly before, as you're saying hi, and, and um, in my head there's this idea of augmentation, and in-world is in fact a tool for creators. Uh, it's a tool that empowers creators that are already telling stories, building characters, building arc. It's just now you adapt that within that tool using natural language, you know. I know how to write, I know how to speak, I can use in world. And that at point, once you create those characters, you just expand this idea of like participatory culture and spreadable media, i.e. anyone can expand on existing characters, understand where you want to deploy when you have a character that goes beyond just the sole existence in a film. There's an afterlife for creators. As a creator, you might give it to, to your audience to then expand on it. And that can exist in games. It can exist in other formats. Like, for instance, you're, we were talking about kids earlier, right? I have an 11-year-old, is obsessed with Wednesday Adams. You know, once Wednesday's finished, <laughs> he misses the character. That dude has spent, he watched all series three times. You know that character inside out. Mm. He went straight to in world. It crafts that own character. He puts scenes on it. He spends hours, he creates in five minutes, spends hours on it, and then interacts with that. That's what the new generation does. And then he sends it to his uh, colleagues, his friends, you know. Once creators tackle the possibility of this and give that power also to their consumers, I think we'll just be expanding on existing formats, but with the beautiful of immersion and expansion across the different so mediums. All movies fashion. are becoming kind of games and, and games evolving into... Exactly. The idea of this convergence of culture, that is not new in any way. I don't yeah. think AI yeah. is reinventing the wheel. I think we've seen this, you know, since the early 2000s, and especially with, with uh, broadband and see how creators came along. We're, we're, you know, so uh, that's the reality. It's just now it's like on steroids, and the possibilities in, in my POV are, are beautiful. Yeah. Fascinating. Because they're participatory and democratizing tools, basically. Yes, we can all become part of the story, and everybody has access to that, exactly. not just limited to a exactly. few people. Elizabeth, when we've seen so many examples throughout the day now where AI is enabling different parts of the existing process to become better, faster, cheaper, more creative, um, what are, in your experience, the paradigms that AI now unlocks um, that go beyond, you know, just going through the existing workflows. Yeah, I, I didn't show a video because I thought it would be weird to show you a video of Instagram or Quest or stuff like that. You, you, I'm sure you guys know the work that we've been working on uh, or the work that, that I've worked on teams with before in the past. But I love what you were saying about giving the user new artistic expression tools. Now, I want to be very clear, too. I think that there has been a lot of conversations about AI only being a facilitator for creators, right? There's some truth in that. And then there's a whole issue of AI replacing creators. And there's, a whole, there's, there's lots to talk about there too. What I would like to focus on though is the space in between when it comes to thinking about things like entertainment. So everyone's got main character syndrome right now. <laughs> And it's interesting to think about how we can create the kind of tools that are sort of more um, pu pulling creativity and immersion out of the end user in the end. It's almost like the storyline is becoming a continuous loop in and out of the original con mm -hmm. conception and the actual receiver of it. I love that. And obviously, AI is giving us incredible tools to make that faster, to make the fidelity so much higher, to bring the craft to it, to pull in all different sources of data to make it richer and more personal, and then also eventually to be able to share that with people and have it be this living kind of model. Um, one of you know my career obsession is with augmented reality because I love the mixture between um, the layer on top of the real world, and as AI starts to charge that up, you know we can think of all sorts of beautiful narratives that we could invite people to walk into and to live, as opposed to sitting and receiving in a more passive way, mm -hmm. um, which could you know obviously really transform everything from gaming to high cinema to fine art. Um, but you know, it, it's it's super important as we get excited about using these 
tools uh, to have serious caution, right? To think about who are we replacing as we create these tools. So in the, I love the tools that you've made, and I'm not wholly familiar with them yet, but I've, I've checked them out, and it's, it's, I don't think any, art, any actor is going out of work because of these non-playing characters, right? And it's also a give and take, there's a call and response between the user and the, and the actual end product. So I just think that we have to ride that line really carefully, and we're gonna have to think about the political aspects, we're gonna have to think about the, um, the end goal, I mean, not to, not to get political right now, but it's capitalism versus creativity in a lot of these situations, right? AI could go full blast and make everything really affordable. And, right, so that's the future we don't want. So I think that in places of power, when we're looking at creating tools like this, being mindful of the humanity that's necessary to make things important, not just for the end result of the actual work, but for the quality of life we have as a species, right? So it's, it's actually like that. What do you tactile. think uh, within that context? You said, you know, you're fascinated by AR and how AI enables to make those experiences interactive, immersive. Let's look at the other side. There's a lot of creators, filmmakers in this room now. Sure. Um, if you think about their role as storytellers, how does that have to evolve uh, within the new context, with the new tools? I think, I think just th rethinking the, who the star of the show is. You know, I, it, thinking about identity in a different way slightly. It involves giving up a bit of control if you're going to be involving the audience in the generation of the actual storyline. But it, it, that's, it's a very, very rich and really pretty untapped area if you think about it. You know, I mean, one could argue that most cinema is still using a lot of the same tropes that we've been using for storytelling since, you know, since <laughs> oral tradition, right? But this way, it's, it's, it's a co-generation back and forth, which yeah. I think could be an incredible revolution. And the, and the viewer is now involved in the story, exactly. so that's really an opportunity for all of you to start to think about your stories that involve the user and, and make it more interactive. Yeah. Tino, you had an example you brought us as well on what Move AI is and how it works. Maybe we can queue up the video um, and you can tell us a little bit more about the, the Move One tool that you recently released, um, really democratizing uh, access to motion tracking and what have been you know, some of the unexpected uh, things that you've seen uh, with, with Move. Yeah, so. I spoke about this about an hour ago, but, but, but those of you who weren't there, you know, our mission is to make creating 3D animation much more accessible and much cheaper to unlock more and more content creators to participate in creating 3D animation. And so we've launched a product recently that allows you to use just a single iPhone to capture video, and that video gets turned into high quality 3D animation. So you can capture pe uh, people in the scene, turns into high quality skeletal 3D animation that you can run inside. Unreal Engine, Unity, or any other game engine. And so this is really exciting for our community so, uh, of animators, because in the past, you know, this whole 3D content creation stack, it's, it's, it's pretty complex. <laughs> it's pretty expensive. And only a few handful of, uh, only a few companies can really, uh, big budget companies can afford to do this. And so hence, you know, there's big studios spending hundreds of millions on movies and games because it's expensive to do. And what's exciting is, is as this tool chain gets disrupted, gets made easier, creating uh, AI NPCs, facial animation, 3D body animation, creating environments, it's going to become much cheaper, uh, much more accessible. And so in the 3D animation space that we're in, you know, we're, for our users, we're making it 10 to 1,000 times cheaper to do, create 3D animation, human animation, wow. versus existing method, methods. That's exciting because now existing users can do more of it, but now this is accessible also to 10 to 1,000 times more people. There are only one, you know, a few million animators out there, but imagine, I think you're going to have 100 million animators quite soon when you can just take a video on your phone and it gets turned into your TikTok dance. What have been some or, of the or, things or that have been like unexpected for you when you've been building it you know, for the creators to use for 3D and animation? What are the things that are, like, you've been blown about? Like, what is so different that you could not imagine your tool being used for? Yeah, so I can go through a few examples, but also at the cusp of releasing this new tool. So 
mine's going to get blown again, I think, uh, in the next <laughs> few weeks and months. I mean, 3D memes. Everyone loves memes, 2D memes. People are creating like these kind of low fidelity 3D memes. They're just funny. They put it on their YouTube. You know, creators can now do this, these kind of things for themselves, for their friends. We're getting um, there's a big digital invite company. So if you've got a wedding, you've got a bridal shower, you can just send an email to your friends, say, hey, come along, and send them a three, uh, an email card, a GIF. But, but, but a company wants to allow their users to capture your motion, put it onto Elsa from Frozen. Wow. And then you can invite somebody to your 10th birthday party, for example, as a digital character. We are coming to the end, unfortunately. For last parting recommendations advice, uh, if I was sitting here, I would want to know what should I do to get started and get involved? What should I do differently tomorrow? Maybe Joanna and, and Elizabeth and, and Timo, you can all have a piece of advice that we can all take away, tactical, tangible, that I can take home, change my mind about something, or, or try something. I think we're amongst creators. We like to create. And therefore, we need to learn. We've, we're used to evolving of tools. And this is a continuation from my POV. That's a continuation of what we're doing. So I think the practical advice is embrace it. Look at what prompt engineering means, what it means in different platforms, and how can those platforms serve you to create more, better prototype, be more efficient, be bolder. Um, so that, that would be my advice. Look at prompt engineer, partner with engineers as creators the same way as creative agencies, head heart directors, and copywriters. I think that's the future as we're moving forward. Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, invite the user into the narrative. Uh, if you just follow that simple, simple path of breadcrumbs, you'll go someplace really weird and awesome. <laughs> and Tino? Yeah, I'll just say stay curious and learn. People are going to be able to, as tools get cheaper and more accessible, people can create really powerful experiences. But then also, um, as Elizabeth said, you know, be careful with that power because there's a, <laughs> that's a lot of, uh, you've, got, you've got to use it responsibly. That's amazing. So if you go out, Get involved, work, pair together creatives and prompt engineers. If you don't have one on your team, get introduced and get work with them, because that unlocks peak potential. And learn about it, because yeah. you know, it's natural language. It's and if you study, and you think about there. stories from a new perspective, as Elizabeth says, like bring viewers into the story. Yeah. Uh, and really experiment and learn, get involved. You have some of the, my favorite platforms and out here, like with Move and InWorld, like go and test and experiment. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and hopefully you'll feel inspired now uh, to get involved. Thank you. Thank you.